That's what Campbell's soups are. Mm, good. Campbell's soups invite you to meet Corliss Archer, starring Janet Waldo. <laughs> Adventures of Ozzie and Harriet, starring the entire Nelson family, Ozzie, Harriet, David, and Ricky. Tonight, we are talking to one of the most recognizable voices of all time. Whether you fell in love with her as Corliss Archer on radio or as the voice of Judy Jetson, Penelope Pitstop, Josie of Josie and the Pussycats, and a host of other characters in cartoons, Miss Janet Waldo has been a part of everyone's childhood. And new generations continue to discover her work because programs like the Jetsons are still on the air. In fact, I don't think they ever went off the air. And they're on DVD, and they remain as popular today as they did back in 1962. Welcome to the show. Gee, how nice to hear a nice voice of such a nice person who remembers Carlos Archer. <laughs> well, I think, I'm just so thrilled. <laughs> you have an amazing beginning to your career, because when I found this out, I was just floored that you were discovered by Bing Crosby. Is that correct? Yes. Well, I, the whole story about that was that Bing was from Washington. I lived in Seattle, Washington, my family and I, and he was coming to Washington because he was going to a homecoming at Gonzaga University, which was in Spokane, Washington. Mm-hmm. So they decided to do a talent hunt. And I was doing a play. I was doing Best in Little Women at that time in school, and they covered that. The, the Scouts and Bing covered it and asked me to uh, enter this contest. And I was very much um, in love with acting and felt that I had done a lot of that and I didn't want to do any contests. But my sister, my big sister, said, you're going to enter it. And I said, no, I'm not, I'm not. And she <laughs> said, yes, you are. <laughs> so I did, and fortunately for all of us, I won it, and the, the prize was that whoever won that contest would be brought to California and uh, given a three-month contract, stock contract, they called it. Mm-hmm. And it was like $50 a week, which was just amazing to me because I'd never heard of that kind of money. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I won it, and my mother and I came to, to California on the train, and uh in fact, I was 15, and, and I'm, a neighbor lady said, you're not going to take that child to that wicked city, are you? <laughs> Were but, you nervous when you met Bing Crosby? Oh, I was so nervous, and I was so thrilled. And Bing was a very quiet man. He didn't chatter a lot, you know. Mm-hmm. And, of course, I do chatter a lot, but <laughs> but I I found myself almost mute with Bing. But he was wonderful to me, just wonderful. And actually, I ended up being there for two years. And I got to work with many of the stars um, because they were all studying. Everybody, all you know, an actor never stops studying. That's true. But uh, I was not happy in pictures. I was terrified all the time. I would, uh, uh, you know, when I was walking down the hall and if a, a director or an important person would be coming down. I'd hide in the little girl's room. <laughs> so that wasn't exactly promoting my career. No. And, and I know you made um, you, you made a few westerns with Tim Holt, who was a well, big cowboy star. I did that star. after I left Paramount. I was dropped finally after two years, which uh, was scary for me because I'd, my whole family had come to California, and I thought, how are we going to live? You know, because $50 a week wasn't a lot, but it was something. <laughs> I'm just assuming that you had to have been somewhat camera shy with what you're telling I me here. I was terribly camera shy, and everybody knew that I was camera shy, and uh, they felt sad for me because I was just 
terrified of the camera. You know, and I remember the, the makeup man using a couple of bad words, which I won't repeat, <laughs> when he'd come up and whisper to me these words, which you can imagine what they I, were. I can. About, you know, to heck with them. Right. <laughs> because he, everybody knew I was terrified. So that limited my relaxing and, and acting well, even though I did get to act, um, as I said, with some of the stars, and, and they, they said she's the best actress on the, on the lot, but they didn't give me a whole lot of roles in films. So when you went into radio, that must have been somewhat of a relief for you. It was so much of a relief that where I was so shy doing pictures or being there for pictures, I was totally excited about radio and, and almost um, brave. I'd walk up to a director and say, I would love to work for you. <laughs> would you consider hiring me or giving me an audition? And I just worked like crazy in radio. And then I, from my picture experience, I had learned to to dress so that someone would notice you. Ah, I and see. And so on stage for the radio shows, I would always wear a full skirt that would flare a little bit, you know, that call attention to myself. <laughs> but, but radio was just heaven to me. I loved radio so much. And then early, early on in my radio career, I got Meet Corliss Archer. <laughs> And here's Corliss Archer. Oh, Mom, do you know what's been happening right under my very nose and I ignored it on account of I had several other things on my mind? Well, I can't imagine, Corliss. Well, it seems that Benson's department store is again having the most utterly super contest. Oh. Oh, not now, dear. You're disturbing your father again. Oh, I'm sorry. Mom, I'll simply die unless I tell you because Benson's is actually having its annual photo contest to pick the sweetheart of the year, and I've just got to... Oh, let's call us your father. How many times must I tell you? Oh, what's the use, Janet? You can't dam up an ocean with your bare hands. <laughs> Spill it, Corliss. Well, Daddy, you remember last year how Benson's had its contest where every boy submitted a picture of his girlfriend and they posted the pictures and everyone voted and the girl who got the most votes was crowned Benson's sweetheart of the year, Remember? I might have remembered before you started that sentence, but I was a young man then. That was thanks to F. Hugh Herbert, who created it. Yes. He, uh, Joan Caulfield, I don't know if you remember her, but she had done it on Broadway on, on the stage. They had, mm -hmm. There was a play of it, and it never went anywhere, but she was Corliss in that play, and he took me to see her performing in that, and um, he was... Wonderful. He was such a great writer, and he had two teenage girls who were very angry that they didn't that he didn't use them. One of them, <laughs> but um, I made very good friends with his daughters, and it was just the most wonderful experience. And I remember when I first auditioned for it, I had been doing little bits and pieces, and uh, what they called in those days "walla walla," yes. you know, background noise. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, and in radio, and they hired me to play Corliss, but I was so nervous that I dropped my entire script on the floor. <laughs> but I don't know. I'm chattering too much. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm going to tell you how I discovered Meet Corliss Archer. Yes, please do. W when I was growing up in the 1970s, I listened to radio programs. I didn't realize they were old radio programs. You know, they sold record albums of various shows. And I was listening to, it was an episode of someone else's show, some variety show, and I think Jack Carson was the guest host. And you came in at the, at the tail end of the show as Corliss Archer and announced that you were moving to that time slot. Oh, my goodness, I remember those <laughs> right. things that I did. And because we kept moving from slot to yes. slot. <laughs> and, I li and I heard this, and I said, well, this, this girl sounds adorable. I have to hear this, this show. Oh, I'm so thrilled. <laughs> so I went and I, I, you know, you have to look around for, for shows. It's not like, uh, you know, a television show where they put it on DVD. You have to do some digging around. Oh, well, I am so thrilled you did because, you know, when I got Judy Jetson on the Jetsons, I didn't breathe a word to anyone that I had been in radio. Really? Oh, because I thought that would just date me. <laughs> See, now I had wondered if you had gotten the role as Judy Jetson because you were the quintessential 
voice of a teenage girl from well, Corliss Archer. I don't really know why I got that role. I auditioned for it with Maury Amsterdam as uh, George Jetson. Mm-hmm. And then I only auditioned, I think, uh, just a couple of times to work with other people that they were considering. And I think they gave it to me from my first audition. But, you know, I've often wondered if Joe Barbera, who chose Penny Singleton to play, uh, yes. you know, from, from a radio show, I wondered if he had heard Meet Corliss Archer, but he never mentioned it. Well, it was a popular show because I know there was a comic book with your likeness. Yes, I remember that. <laughs> so there was a lot of that. And I've heard at least, I think, 24 of the episodes. Really? Oh, yes. They're, they're out there. You have to search around oh, for them. really? The show was on for, I think, a good 10 years. Uh-huh. Oh, it was. Yes. Exactly 10 years. And over time, I think 24 or 30 of the Meet Corliss Archer shows uh, have been released in some capacity. Well, I, I'm not surprised, and I got, a, I got a tape of a Corliss Archer show, and I'm just now looking quickly for um, who puts it out. Um, with it, they had a picture. It's Radio Spirits, I think. Radio Spirits? Com- yes. You knew about that? Oh, yes. I was so surprised. I had no idea that they were, they were doing that. But I, I love this program, and I, you know, it's a wonderful family show, and Sam Edwards is just fantastic oh, as I tell Dexter. You, Sam Edwards, can I tell you briefly a mm-hmm. story? Uh, the, when we first started it, a, a young boy who was Dexter uh, was the son of Ken Christie. I don't know if you remember Ken Christie, mm. who was a very big radio person. And his son died after he'd only played about four or five Oh, my goodness. Corliss. And we were all so shaken by that, by that and I thought, it will never continue because he was good and but then they they opened had an open audition and and sammy edwards told me that he thought corliss archer had something to do with bows and arrows (laughs) and he didn't have any idea what he was auditioning for but sammy he grew and was got better and better and better all the time and then he could do that wonderful Corliss, oh, oh yes. Corliss, you know, <laughs> which everybody loved. And he was such a good actor and such a sweet man. And, you know, it's funny because I think later on he would play heavies in, in a lot oh, of TV shows. Oh, yeah. He was just a really good actor. Corliss, dear, we've been through all this. You are not going to take a job. You've got a great deal of homework to do during vacation to make up for your poor grades. So just forget all about it. But, Mom, you don't realize it is absolutely imperative that I should get a good, steady-paying job. You mean imperative. And how, Daddy? (laughs) What is it, Dexter? Holy cow, haven't you finished breakfast yet? Hi, everybody. Hello, Dexter. Good morning, Dexter. Dexter. Gee whiz, but you take a long time to eat. Holy cow. Corliss, do you still crave a steady, well-paying job? Well, of course, Daddy. Are you going to let her go to work, Mr. Archer? Shut up, Dexter. Uh, what did you have in mind, Daddy? Would you like to earn $50, Corliss? <gasps> Golly! Fifty bucks! Holy cow! Shut up, Dexter! Uh, what would I have to do, Daddy? I will pay you the sum of $50, Corliss, if you can wean Dexter permanently from his favorite deity, that eternal holy cow. <laughs> Another radio program you appeared on, and also the television version, happens to be one of my all-time favorite shows, and that's The Adventures of Ozzy and Harry. Oh, you are speaking of the love. Of, I, I used to feel guilty because I loved it even more than Corliss. Because doing Emmy Lou, you know, Yoo-hoo, Mr. Nelson! <laughs> and I had that little bit on that show, which was like, uh, you know, 60, well, maybe three minutes. But uh, Ozzy, I learned so much from Ozzy because that was early in my career, and he taught me things about how to, you know, deal with the audience. And, and he said, uh, you, can, you, can eat, you can be a little more breathy if you want, you know, Janet. And I said, oh, all my life I've tried to stop my breathiness, you know, <laughs> because I was told in, in classes at school, you're, you're too breathy, you're too breathy. And he said, you can be more breathy if you want. And I thought, oh, goody, I can be myself. <laughs> but that was written by top writers. Hal Cantor and Sherwood Schwartz and really wonderful writers who would write that little few-minute spot of Emmy Lou, and they were all 
beautifully written, if you remember. Oh, yes. One of the uh, episodes I was listening to just the other day, uh, Bing Crosby was the guest. Oh, so yeah. You... <laughs> and was I hysterical oh, that day? You were swooning. <laughs> Come in. Oh, hello, Emmy Lou. Oh, hello, Emmy. Come on in and sit down. Oh, I can't sit down. I'm too excited. I'm so thrilled. I've got cold chills running up my spine. <laughs> what was that? They ran down again. <laughs> Take it easy, Emmy Lou. Take it easy? Oh, Mr. Nelson, how can you say that? Evidently, you haven't heard the news. He's here in town, the one, the only, Bing Crosby. Not a movie, not a photograph, not a record, but for real, himself in the... I blush when I say it. Flesh. <laughs> I hate to disillusion you, Emmy Lou, but Bing Crosby is not in town. It's just a silly rumor that got started. Oh, Mr. Nelson, I'm sure you're mistaken. I know he's in town. I feel it. I just love Bing Crosby. He's so... so... <laughs> I used to think Rudy Valley was... <laughs> oh, now, well... <laughs> Harriet, stop dripping that wet dish cloth down my leg. <laughs> well, I hate to rush off, but I simply have to spread the good news. Uh, uh, Emmy, won't you give us just one more little squeal before you go? Oh, Mr. Nelson. Ozzy, oh, stop teasing her. Oh, please, Emmy. Uh, wait, let me loosen my tie. <laughs> now look into my eye. For you, my life, my love, my all. <laughs> I surrender, dear. <laughs> yes, I remember that. Oh, he always he would always get a squeal in there. Someplace. Yes, yeah. <laughs> it was a very funny scene. What I love about your portrayal uh, uh, as Corliss Archer and also as Emmy Lou, and it goes into the Jetsons as well as Judy Jetson. When you play the typical fifteen-year-old girl. You do it without any cynicism at all. It's everything is genuine and heartfelt in your performances. Oh well, that's good. That's what I hope. Yes, and and it, I I certainly loved it, and I loved being. And after Paramount, I was so relieved to be myself, because in Paramount, you know, I tried to be glamorous and uh, be some gorgeous person, and I I didn't know how, you know. <laughs> well. When you play, uh, you know, these characters, and you played Emmy Lou on the TV series, too. I was just watching yes, that the I other did. day. Boy, have you done your homework. I watched, uh, it was an episode where uh, Ozzy was in a play, and you came over. And... Oh, I remember. You know that Ozzy loved those little episodes, the Emmy Lou portion, so much that he had just the Emmy Lou spots put on some tapes. And I have often wished that I could get hold of them. I have, uh, because David Nelson, who was such a sweetheart and, and the last one from the family to die, he, he died quite recently. Uh, I could have spoken, he would have gotten those for me, I know, but they put them all. Ozzy loved them. He, we had such a good time. And he really, he really taught me so much because he was very, radio wise and mm. he would you know just give me little hints and things of uh, you know how to handle a laugh you know not to walk into it or or to do anything you know to expect it not to expect it and uh, he was just um, just a wonderful teacher and guide to me it was a beautiful experience doing that show and I also loved it on TV and the only reason that he stopped using me was because the boys were getting so big, yeah. and they were wondering why Emmy Lou and the boys didn't get together. Right. And, uh, of course, you made a very famous guest appearance on I Love Lucy. Oh, you, you know all about my favorite thing. <laughs> As Peggy. That has caused more fan mail for me and more people remembering it. And you know that, that remember, you probably, if you remember that episode, uh, Desi said, keep jiggling, Peggy, keep jiggling. And people right. come up to me now, you know, fans who want autographs, and they say, keep jiggling, Janet, keep jiggling. <laughs> well, to think that you had a scene, you shared a scene with Lucille Ball on that show is just remarkable. Well, they were wonderful to work with, and I was so thrilled. And I had never done, it was a three-camera show, and I had never done on camera before. I mean, except at Paramount, which was where I was 
trying to be glamorous. Right. <laughs> and um, and it was different. You know, it was it was just like a radio show except with cameras. Now look, Peggy, Mrs. Ricardo, let's be adult about this. <laughs> I'm in love with your husband. Are you sure about what you're saying, Peggy? Do you know it's love and not infatuation? Oh, yes. My infatuations only last a little while. This has been going on for two whole weeks. <laughs> two whole weeks. Well, there's a little thing you overlooked, Peggy. Ricky is married. I know. Doesn't that make it sophisticated? <laughs> well, yes. And he's so much more worldly than the boys I know. Well, I should hope so. He's a little older, too. I know. He's middle-aged. What? <laughs> he must be pushing 23. <laughs> yeah, he's pushing 23, all right. In fact, he's pushed it all the way to 35. <laughs> From there, it wasn't that much longer that uh, you got the Jetsons. That was probably 1962. That's right. That's right. Well, actually, I was working on a series with Tony Franciosa. Do you remember him? Yes. Uh, called Valentine's, Valentine's Day. Day, yes. And I played his secretary, and uh, I was working on that show, and, they, and my agent called me and said, uh, do you want to audition for a cartoon? And I said, a cartoon? And he said, yeah, and I said, well, gee, that, that sounds like it would be just like radio. I'd love to do it. George O'Hanlon, just, you know, he wonderful. He was brilliant, and he would never do other voices, uh, and nor did Penny Singleton. But I was so intrigued with the actors I was working with, like Howie Morris. He played Jet Screamer, which is yes. one of the first shows I did. Zoom, Dad, Zoom! <laughs> He was, you know, standing in front of the mic where, where in pictures I had been taught to be very still and move very slowly and be very soft-spoken and not too energetic. Mm -hmm. And he was just all over the place with his arms waving around and doing weird things. And, and then uh, uh, all of the people, uh, Gene Vanderpile, I don't know if you remember. Oh, yes, of course. But uh, all of the people I worked with were so versatile. They could play so many parts. So I asked Joe Barbera if I could do some other parts other than, than Judy, and he said, make me a tape. <laughs> so I happened to be married to a wonderful writer, and I bet you you've heard about him. I have uh, indeed. He wrote something uh, <laughs> that's very, very famous, a, a landmark story. You are story. Really so informed. You're, you're married. I, I want to get this straight. that you're, <laughs> you're married to Robert E. Lee, but not that Robert E. Lee. <laughs> I always straighten that out with people. I say, that's the original. <laughs> that, would be, that would be pretty remarkable if that, <laughs> if that were possible. Bob wrote a, a wonderful uh, book about, he, he loved his name, and I tried to get him to take the E out of it when we were married, because my <laughs> sister said, you can't be Mrs. Robert E. Lee. <laughs> so he said, nope, nope, that's my name. I'm sorry, but that's my name. So he wrote a, a book about Robert E. Lee, General Robert E. Lee, about a uh, a romance, or not a romance, but a correspondence with um, a, a woman. And it was actually a 40-year correspondence, and it's one of my proudest things. Mm -hmm. Because I did lose my dear husband uh, not too long ago, and he wrote this book, and I made it into, I cut it into a thing and made it a, a radio show. Oh, okay. And I've gotten such good reaction to it, and... Um, and Norman Corwin, do you remember him? Oh, he's yes, he passed away a couple of years ago as well. Yeah. And he was, well, uh, he was the narrator on it. Mm. And, and I made a, a radio show. It was just really a three-person radio show. And uh, The Lost Letters of General Robert E. Lee. And he, uh, Bob wrote about, because he knew that there had been correspondence. Right. You know. But anyway, it's created quite a... Quite a stir. <laughs> well, of course, I should tell listeners, uh, your husband was most famous for uh, writing Inherit the Wind. Yes, absolutely. We it was just here in, Los An in San Diego, actually, oh, San Diego, okay. California. And uh, I'm very proud of that. That was just 
a brilliant show. And then, of course, he wrote Mame. Oh, yes, Auntie Mame, and yes. Auntie Mame. But, but anyway, the, um, the first voice he gave me, Joe gave me, when I, when I sent him a tape, because naturally my husband wrote the copy for me, and I wanted to be, you know, pretty ugly and pretty big and <laughs> horrible, and they cast me as a mother-in-law. <laughs> this was Verna Felton had played it. Ah, I see. And they cast me as a, as a mother-in-law. That was the second role I got in, in cartoons. That was on the Flintstones, right? Yeah. Yes, of course. I just want to get, uh, I, I want to get a few uh, favorites in. Uh, Penelope Pitstop would be one. Oh, Penelope. I love playing <laughs> Penelope Pitstop. <laughs> that was sort of a, a, a cartoon based on like the perils of Pauline. The, that's the silent, right. Yes. Exactly. That's what Joe Barbera told me when he cast me in it. And he said that's, Joe was great at, at getting ideas from other people <laughs> and using them to advantage. And, and uh, that was, Originally, it was another series before it was The Perils of... Oh, Wacky Races. Wacky Races. Boy, you certainly know your radio and television and movies. I watched a lot of stuff when I was a kid. It's so good to be free of that hooded fiend. You spoke too soon, Penelope. You're right. I spoke too soon. Once again, the hooded claw is up to his treacherous tricks. <laughs> ah, ah, Penelope, so nice to have you in my clutches again. <laughs> and th- a little later on, you did Josie of Josie and the Pussycats. And I love that, and you know, fans always want to know about Josie and the Pussycats, and of course, the Jetsons. Penelope Pitstop. Penelope Pitstop. Right. Those three are the most favorite of all of most of the fans. And you had great. You had a great cast on uh, Josie and the Pussycats. You had Casey Kasem in there. Oh yes. Right. The two girls were the three girls were wonderful, and we we have done appearances together. It's the van. I wonder if they're in that old mill. Help! That was Alexander, and it sounds like they're in trouble. I'll bet this is the mastermind's hideout. There they are, and they're tied to those gears. We'll never get down in time to shut off the windmill. All of these shows are on uh, DVD. Josie and the Pussycats, the entire series is out on DVD. And so is uh, the Jetsons. All of the Jetsons are are out on DVD. In fact, the the Jetsons came back in the 80s. It was so popular, and there was a movie, a Rockin' with Judy Jetson movie that went to uh that just came out i think last year well rockin with judy jetson was we did that and that's what gave them the idea for trying to make judy a rock star right but then they tried that with the girl that they thought was going to be a big rock star right and they they did a movie which was a, which unfortunately a dud <laughs> and joe barbera bless his heart never stopped apologizing to me for that. <laughs> Well, the one that you did, where uh, poor Judy... Yeah, I she, remember that. Yeah, you, you write a song, and uh, the rock star screws up the lyrics. Yeah, oh, you <laughs> yes. are so amazing. And that was, I, I remember that so well and, and love doing it. And uh, you did Judy Jetson uh, a couple of years ago, I think, for a television commercial, right? Oh, yeah. My gosh, how do you remember that? And I barely can. I, I see all these things uh, on YouTube, and I see them online. And I do want to mention that you, uh, as, as we start to wrap up here, because I feel like I'm taking up so much of your time. You're not. <laughs> you're fascinating. Well, thank you. I, uh, you, you returned to radio on uh, Adventures in Odyssey not that long ago. Yes, yes. And Alan Young played my place, my husband. You know, that, that was some time ago that we did that, and then, mm-hmm. you know, they... They re- revived it recently, and it's re- been revived quite recently, and Alan and I are still playing the husband and wife. That's what, I think people should realize that with a lot of these TV shows, like the Jetsons, for example, that was only on for one season, but it was in reruns forever. Well, the first 24 episodes that were made to begin with, um, we're trying to get it to be a nighttime show, mm-hmm. and uh, the Disney... Uh, kind of overcame the, the Hanna Barbera people, so they they put it on morning Saturday morning, and it played Saturday morning, and that's where it got its whole audience. Were those first Saturday morning? We only did twenty four of them, but they played them over and over again. And Joe Barbera directed all of those, and I got to tell you, he was a wonderful director. And um, 
then that's what brought them back because they had built up quite an audience for the Jetsons, and then that's why they kept making more and more and more. Altogether, I think they made about 60. <laughs> probably, probably. Well, it has been such a joy to speak with you. Oh, and can I say, likewise, <laughs> you are a delight, and the lucky people who get to listen to you all the time. Well, thank you so much, but I, I have to do this because it's always been a dream to say this to you. So, so I'm going to, I'm just going to back away from my microphone for a moment. Okay. I'll say, get ready, here it comes. Carlos! Oh, Carlos! I, oh, <laughs> oh, you're so close. You are so <laughs> Sammy Edwards. You are so perfect. And nobody else could do that except Sammy and now and you. <laughs> I, th- I said, I have to do that with Corliss Archer. Oh, God. You are such a delightful person. Thank you so much, Miss well, Waldo. I've had such a good time. It's just too short. I know. We'll have to do it again sometime. <laughs> Thank you so much for calling me. I've really enjoyed it. All right. I'm going to go listen to me, Corliss Archer, right now. <laughs> <laughs> good. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. <laughs>